Disclosure. The act of making secret information known. In this series, when we say disclosure, we're referring to the decades-long fight to compel the U.S. government to declassify facts about non-human intelligence and technologies. Before long, this reality will be undeniable. undeniable. When natural disasters hit, we have evacuation plans, drills, brightly colored signs, because we have hard data against our own common sense that these things will happen again. And we have just as hard data these events cause trauma and trauma-related disorders, but we don't have any orange cones for that. There's no stop, drop, and roll or duck and cover when it comes to a threat to our collective reality, yet. Robert Schur is a doctor of psychology with an expertise in treating people with PTSD with community-based methods. He's gonna teach us how to become emotional first responders for loved ones and neighbors who are reacting negatively to anything from a hurricane to a market drop to news of ruins on the moon. This time, we not only know the storm is coming, we're rallying for louder thunder. So before we call down the rain, let's batten down some hatches for our fellow sapiens. This is a big one, the biggest, but we keep our wits about us and our uniquely sapient sense of humor, we got this. Sapiens is Latin for wise. Let's keep that in mind. There are children present. I'm Tom Ross and you're on US6. My name is Carl Wolf and I was a precision electronics photographic repairman with a top secret crypto clearance. In the United States Air Force, I was stationed at Langley Air Force Base in Virginia. In 1965, um, in mid-1965, I was loaned to the Lunar Orbiter Project at NASA on Langley Field. Uh, Dr. Colley was in charge of that project. They had problems with a piece of uh, electronic equipment that was bottlenecking their production of photographs. I went to the facility, and when I walked into the facility, there were scientists from all over the world. I was stunned, actually, to see people at a NASA project uh, from all over the world. It didn't make any sense to me initially. Um, I was taken into the laboratory where the equipment was malfunctioning. I couldn't repair it in the dark. I asked to have it removed. A uh, airman second class was in the dark room at that time. I was also an airman second class. Um, I was interested in how the whole process functioned how the data got from the lunar orbiter to the laboratory. I asked the young man if he described the process to me. He did. About 30 minutes into the process, he said to me, um, in a very distressed way, um, by the way, we've discovered a base on the backside of the moon. And then he proceeded to put photographs down in front of me, and clearly in these photographs were structures, uh, mushroom-shaped buildings, spherical buildings, and towers. And at, at that point, I was very concerned because I knew we were working on compartmentalized security. He had breached security, and I was actually frightened at that moment. And I did not question him any further. And a few moments later, someone did come into the room. Um, I worked there for three more days, and I remember going home and naively thinking, I can't wait to hear about this on the evening news. And here it is, more than 30 years later, and I hope we hear about it tonight. And I will testify under oath before Congress. The UFO phenomenon in the United States of America is a caricature of a little gray alien all over Facebook, all over posters and everything. That is not what it is. That is the Disneyland version of ufology, which this country commercializes on and, and, uh, and doesn't look at uh, the history of this. I've written five books like this of word-for-word -word interviews that people have given me whether they be uh, scientists or intelligence people, people like uh, the remote viewers in, in California to the former defense minister of Canada, Colonel Philip Corso, to Alan Hynek, who's known as the godfather of ufology, to Monsignor Balducci. And then it took me maybe 25 years to start questioning who was visiting the planet and talking about the extraterrestrial presence, because I think it wasn't that I was afraid. I just didn't have any place to put it in my computer. I didn't know there is nothing to compare it with. I think that's our goal or what we have to do is 
become the people that provide answers, real answers, not the fake, awkward crap that we're being fed in the mainstream media. And now I'll ask Officer Stein and his colleagues to escort the accused into the room so that we may all look upon the guilty party. Don't get him too close to me, please. <laughs> <You know. clears throat> this just goes to show that you guys are entirely too serious. <laughs> I don't want the trickle down. We're, that's that's the number one, uh, my number one goal is not no trickle down. We're not playing those games anymore. We're done. It's been 30, 40 years of trickle down, and we're done with that. And furthermore, I, I call it the Spartacus moment. At the end of, of Kubrick Spartacus, they wanted to find out who Spartacus was among the. And everybody stood up and said, "I'm Spartacus. I'm Spartacus." And they, and they had to kill everybody. Uh, I think that's what we have to do. We have to stand up, just start putting free energy machines in our houses and stuff, and say, "Come arrest me." If we roll this out slowly, um, the benefit is, of course, that it gives people far more time to adjust to it. it it's a gradual process. They can uh, start to uh, develop competency skills. They can start to develop um, a, a safety net. So if it doesn't really go the way they want it to, they can have a plan B or a plan C or something else to do. Um, of course, the problem with that is that Nowadays, people's attention span seems to be so short that uh, they may just forget to practice, you know, much like uh, forgetting to do their homework or something like that. The, the ultimate goal is total disclosure. The ultimate goal is the free energy devices and the ion ba uh, streamers that they've invented. All those things are real. Travel to other planets is all possible. They're doing it all the time. Uh, and it's. They want to keep it to themselves. That's the whole plot, is to keep it to themselves and slowly kill us. And uh, they don't want us to have it, because they know that once we have it, they're done. You know, if we have it all at once, though, um, there will probably be a far greater propensity for people to panic. And we might see a spike in that type of behavior, but I think that after that we would probably see a pretty steady decline. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of door number three. I think that uh, there is a balance between rolling it out slowly, trickle down effect, and ripping the duct tape off or ripping the band-aid off. Um, I think there's a, a medium between there and maybe you know, we can roll it out slowly to the point where we start to identify more of the people in our community that can help and that are willing to help. Many people are afraid of change. Why? Because they're comfortable in a pain that they're used to, in an island of safety, afraid of the unknown. But when you're living in suffering and you say, that's it, you know, I don't care what's in the unknown. I don't want to stay in the known where it's suffering, especially if I'm going to pass away and my little ones are going to stay there. No, it's time to really make a change. And, you know, our ancestors have been passing the torch for so many years. And they say, if you stay in the past, you know, you will stay in the past. The thing is to stay in the present and overcome anything that you need to overcome. So the moment of fear comes in, the moment of shift comes in. Of course we're gonna feel the fear because that's divine or God talking to us to take action for this mind to stand up. And when this mind stands up, you know, it cannot be fooled by itself. So this is when we're gonna take action. In the world, there is a bacteria, you know, like the body that has a good bacteria and it has negative bacteria. So we humans are like bacteria in this earth. And once I wake up, you know, they start to help the earth. They're good bacteria. And the ones who are sleeping, well, you know, they're doing their work, you know. It's not like they're not doing their work, they're doing their work. I went from doing all the research of the 50s to looking at why they didn't come back to where they went. And then when I realized they went where the people would receive them the most and everything, then I went to Latin America and then I studied Sisto Poswell's and under him was Enrique Villanova. When we started in Rama, in this group of contact in Peru, I was 18 years old. One day I uh, saw this uh, news, um, news guy talking about the Rama group they were going to have a supposed encounter of the third kind in the Chilca Desert, 60 kilometers south of the capital in Lima, Peru. So I went to the group. They told me, no, you don't have the preparation. You need at least one year with the group in order to participate of our events. But still, I found my way in and I went with my dad and we got lost in the desert. We couldn't get to the place. When we went back to Lima, it was 1 a.m. and there was a blackout, the whole city. We thought at the time it was a terrorism. When we arrived home, um, I was really discouraged, I was sad. 
and I went to my room and then I heard this buzzing sound like zzz, it was around us and I went to my brother asked him can you hear that and my brother no he couldn't but I noticed all the uh, dogs in the block they were like, barking like agitated like something was going on that night I had a big uh, it started with dreams uh, a, a dream where I have this meeting with these two beings they gave me a lot of information about our solar system, some bases they have in, not in planets, but in moons of our solar system, like in Ganymedes, uh, Saturn, uh, Titan, and other uh, satellites, and also in, the, in our moon. And um, as I heard that history of our solar system, uh, I woke up feeling like nobody's going to understand this. I have to be part of the Rama group. I decided that I was going to try something that in Rama is called uh, antenna. The antenna is the person that receives uh, telepathic messages. So one night I grabbed paper and pen and just opened my mind the way they told us it could happen and waited for 15 minutes and I just felt some energy running in my shoulders and that was it. Day, after, day uh, later, at the same hour, 11 p.m., I tried the same thing. And then I felt the energy, but also the presence of someone in the room. So I thought maybe my father or my, my brother, I don't know, I look around, no one. So I said, okay, I'm gonna try it tomorrow again. It's the third attempt. If nothing happened, then I'm not the antenna, probably. So the third night, I was with paper and pen waiting. When I felt the energy, that's the same thing as the other day. And then I felt the presence of someone. I opened the eyes, no one, okay? When I closed my eyes, I saw clearly, as I see with my eyes, someone approaching me from the back and his hands getting closer to my, uh, the back of my head. And when the hands get close, I felt this energy going through my skull with a buzzing sound, like bzzz, bzzz. And in the third, during the third buzzing sound, there was an explosion of light. And then I opened my eyes and this being was standing in the other side of the table. He told me that uh, I have to go back to my group and explain what happened. Because in between the group, uh, we were about 15 kids, um, one of us already have the, the telepathic channel open. And I tried to sleep that night. Next day, first hour, I went to my group and explained to the guys and no one believed me in the group. No one. They were like, they were playing ping pong at the time. And then Victor, a guy that was away from the group for two weeks, he arrived. And he heard my story and he said, but what did you do? Exactly tell me step by step, what did you do? So I explained to him and he was the only one that was curious about it. Two days later, he called me and he says, I, I cannot stop this. It's his ideas, he's adding my mind all the time. I'm writing. Uh, in the bus, in napkins, I, I can stop receiving this. It's kind of a psychography. So Victor Benitez was the antenna of my group. He started to, to receive this information, and through him we received invitations to go to the, to the south coast of Lima, uh, to Chilca, to Marcahuasi, and many other places in Peru. And we have some experiences. Little did I know that uh, when I went to interview Ricardo Gonzalez that I would be invited to participate. He said, Paula, uh, I have a reunion in Shasta of 126 people. We are going to do medis meditation on the 21st, I think, of September 2014, the solstice. We invite you to be part of it because Antarel, the being, wants you there. And I thought, that this is not true. It's, he's just saying that because he just wants me to go. And I said, I'm not coming. I can't do that. Plus, I don't camp. I was sitting there and at 8.30, sure enough, I was sitting next to the guy that had the night screening uh, apparatus that was filming and I saw the crafts, there were two of them, came right over our head. And he walks over to me, he kneels down in front of me and he says, Paula, he said, Antarel is in the forest, he's here, can you handle it? And the word was, can you handle it? I was in shock for one minute and then my brain just said if you don't do it you're gonna 
be sorry. And I said, okay, I'll do it. And he said, you won't be alone. I'm going to tell you how to do it. You can't use a flashlight. It's, it's dark because there's no moon. Be careful what you what you walk on, you would just step on. He said, and um, my girlfriend, he says, is down there already, and she's standing in front of him. She had a white parka on, uh, and she, he says, when you come to her, you know that he's right there. And I noticed that between these hills, there was this uh, mist, like white mist, coming at the level of the floor. That very thick mist. That was not normal. That thing was bright. Like it has its own light. In, uh, when when these, these people, especially people from Apu, come, they create a mist, it's a support hole that looks like a dome, and it's called the Zendra. So I already knew about the Zendra because of Six Sopas. So Ricardo says, see that little tree there? You wait until the Zendra comes out of the ground, because that's where you're going to stand. You know, I've got two girls on the other end of me, so I'm, I'm old and on for dear life. So I'm walking down to a stand in the Zendra, but he told me that the minute I got there, I had to let go. Somebody says, what was the most terrifying part of this? I would say letting go of Mercedes' hand, because then I was alone. I couldn't see where I was going, even though my eyes got used to it, so enough to see on Tarao. Uh, so I, I got down there and I let go and I saw in front of me his girlfriend, because his girlfriend, and here she was moving towards this 10 foot tall guy that was standing with his back against a tree and his hands out like this by his side. I didn't know what to say, so in my mind I was going, I respect you, Antarel, I respect you. That's all I could say to him, because I have nothing in common with him. So he, he just, he, he was talking in a language I couldn't understand. It sounded like a radio transmission that was like a bullhorn. And it went on for, I think, maybe four seconds of just talking and talking, and the other two ladies did not hear it. I heard him. I mean, I heard him. Because at the very end, in English, and this is the part that, that gave me, uh, you know, really got to me. He, he said, it's like a, a, um, a robot. When the brain or the body, when the human organism is faced with overwhelming adversity, okay, we see something that's absolutely terrifying. Basically what's happening in that situation is the brain's limbic system is kicking in. Okay? The limbic system is what is also known as the paleocortex. It's the part of the brain that is um, responsible for sheer and utter survival, and that's it. I think what's happening in reality is the body has basically made the decision that it's going to perish, that this is it. And so it floods our system with natural painkillers giving us a sense of euphoria to where we really don't feel anything. The problem sometimes with post-traumatic stress is when someone doesn't perish and they've gone into that state, they come back, oftentimes the body doesn't reset back down to base, base levels. So there's always this sense that something else is happening. There's always this sense that we're under attack, that we're under fire. When I lived in Sedona, we dealt with it weekly. I mean, we, I had many, many cases of people with extraterrestrial contact that were very seriously affected by that contact. One woman who we found her wandering out in Boynton Canyon, stuttering, and uh, they didn't know, they brought her to my office because they couldn't understand her. And when I sat her down and uh, we started, you know, I started working with bringing the alignment in for her and getting her back into her body, it turned out that she'd been wandering out in the canyon, got lost, got abducted, uh, was terrified, and had lost her mind. And we were able to bring the light in and reconnect her, and as it reconnected her, words started coming back. Then she got back in her body, she could speak again, she told me the story. And then we spent time working with, you know, her issues, in other words, how to deal with the fear of um, essentially being attacked or being taken or you know the lack of safety that comes up in situations like that. The inside elite have surrounded themselves with a group of technocrats 
who like Snowden, who watch everything that's going on and right at a certain point, and I think we've actually gone past that point already, the technocrats become more important than the people inside. And the technocrats start asking themselves, why are we why are we serving them? We know more than they do. And they're slowly releasing information in, in crazy, strange ways. And it's because of what we're doing that they're releasing it. They just released the Quantum Drive, NASA. That thing's been around for 30 years. I was told 30 years ago they had this. Gravity waves. Nikolai Kozarev was talking about gravity waves in the 50s. T. Townsend Brown was talking about gravity waves. He was showing you how you can do anti-gravity waves. They're realizing that they've got to get this out somehow, and they want to do it in this trickle-down fashion. So what we want to do is get ahead of them and say, yeah, this is true, but all this other stuff's true also. It's not free energy. That's a misnomer. Parts wear down. You need electricity to start it up. So it's not free energy. It's nearly free energy. So, you know, you, you, you take a capacitor and charge it to 100,000 volts. You take another capacitor and you charge it to 10,000 volts. You stick one capacitor on a rod, the other one on the other this side, right? And you stick the rod on top of a pole and then you just push it. And pretty soon what happens is the 100,000 volt capacitor begins pushing the 10,000 volt capacitors, like magnets pushing each other, and then they start and they keep going, and pretty soon they're powering themselves off the ion stream. And everybody can do this. I mean, you can go down to Radio Shack for 250 bucks and, and build this thing and never have to pay electricity bill again. There's going to be a period between the time uh, of the oil economy and the free energy economy, then the, there's going to be a lacuna that's going to be really, really difficult to live through distribution services are going to break down, everything's going to break down. Farmers who are dependent on oil to grow their food are suddenly going to find that they can't, they can't depend on that anymore and, and they're going to have to change the ways that they're going to do things too. I don't think that, I don't think that the average person cares because if they do care, it's going to change their whole entire world and they would rather just watch the Super Bowl, drink a couple of beers and go to the grocery store and not worry about this stuff. They don't want to take the responsibility of it. That's their business model, is fear. Keep everybody terrified. How are you going to sell pharmaceuticals to people who aren't terrified? How are you going to sell arms to people who aren't terrified? It ain't going to work. Two biggest industries on earth, arms, pharmaceuticals. The average person doesn't really want to, you know, change their lives. There is no way you can have any kind of uh, vested interest in this on a spiritual level and not change your life. And, and people don't want that. They, they're happy. They're happy walking around ignorant. It is not the government's just keeping the secret. It's the, it's the general public <laughs> that's keeping the secret. They know who changes the planet. They know who wants world peace. They know that this paradigm needs to be changed by when we kill all these people. We kill everybody that's ever come here. The, the Gandhis and the Christs and the John Lennons and the... We kill them all. They want the planet to be represented by the human race. They do not want the planet to be represented by the Chinese, the Russians, the Americans, and so forth. So they want us to join as one humanity, one group of people who are not killing each other, to try to evolve to a state where we can have a conversation with them. By identifying that there are multiple ways to cope, I don't think limits um, our ability to have an effective disclosure. I think it actually maximizes the, uh, the positive effect. I think there will be a certain amount of fear with a certain amount of people. And I think that uh, a certain amount of those people will have that certain amount of fear uh, reach levels to where it's non-productive. But I think overall, as a, as a planet, we know this is needed. As a planet, we know that we're, you know, we're on borrowed time. As a planet, I think we know that it's not working. As a planet, I think we know that there's far too much conflict and far too little love. And as a planet, I think that there can't be any possible way that people don't know we have to change in order to survive. You know, we're one of the very few species that is so good at adapting that we can pretty much live anywhere under any conditions. How many other animals can say that? You know, we're really selling ourselves short if we think we're not gonna do this well and we're not gonna come out far better than we were before it started. I don't 
want to live in a fear with my kids and my grandkids and every uh, that there's no hope. I mean, since when uh, humans are humans are really cool people. I mean, really, humans can do this. It's it's those other people that you know that are thinking that uh, we're all different to try to separate, whether it be by religion or or ideology, uh, the separateness. But we're all basically the same. My teacher used to say, if you really knew your religion well, all religions would be the same religion, which would be the religion of unity. There is, there is no difference. We're at the time we have to be bigger than the limitations of the human ego and the control and the power structures on this planet that want to keep us from oneness. Stay calm, keep cool, and don't, don't ever let fear. That, that'll kill you. So fear is the greatest killer on earth, and, uh, and you have to have no fear no fear at all. It's not like this is the end of everything. This is a, there's, we live in a multiverse and don't believe when people tell you that this is all there is. There's a lot more to the universe than we can ever imagine. It's time in this generation to not be driven by the wild horse. Like if you want to go to that destination point A and it takes to point C, no. Now we're going to wake up to get that wild horse and go to point A. No matter what resistance we have in our body because remember Everything the body tells us, the fear, the nervous system, is just a divine talking to us to take the action. Now the shaman, the Nagwa, wakes up having the strength in the mind to serve the love of its life, which is this, and which is everybody else's body. It's a whole consciousness. So this shift that's happening, you know, it's, 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 meant, it's meant to happen. You know, it's, 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 it's the time right now. The shift is a cycle that has been happening for many generations to reach this point. Just imagine all the consciousness that exists right now, the technology. It's time to put it in our favor. And uh, really, it's to go beyond fear. It brings me back to the, the idea of why I got into medicine to begin with. Of course, that was to help other people. What got me down that road was I came home from fighting wars and saw a need. I saw a need in myself. I saw a problem in myself in the sense that I had been through something very, very terrible something very traumatic, something very dramatic, and I didn't know how to understand it. And the more I asked people that I thought should know what to do, the more I realized they couldn't help me. While change is difficult, what we discovered this weekend is change is coming. We went out and we reminded people of their responsibility, that they're healers, they're on the forefront of this, and we're going to look to them for answers when it all comes down. More than anything, we've heard from everyone that we're welcome here and that we're willing to welcome those that are coming. But we have to remind them of those that aren't in the know, those that don't know anything about what's coming. mind-blowing I was I was watching that space shuttle go up in the movie it, almost anything as we know it would be touched in some way I would believe well I guess my very first thoughts are concern for what the typical person would be thinking if this is true then who knows what else could be true there's people on the moon and you know now there may have been other civilizations on the moon and we're just 
petty about you know stupid things that you know can easily be solved but a change of that magnitude I think drives fear fear seems to be one of the final barriers how do we get over that it's it's all about education education comes in many forms every day and every minute and keep your eyes open because if your eyes are open, your mind is open, take it in. It's almost like everyone has to become their own scientist. Because if you cannot trust the mainstream, uh, the, the television, the mainstream science, to tell you about the most helpful things to you, you have to experiment for yourself. It, everyone just has to be an open-minded person. Until we reach that point, then the aliens are not going to come down and join us. I mean, the main generation that should be affected by this is mine. So I think uh, the sooner this comes out, the better. And people aren't going to be ready for it, but we will. We will.